Although I'm a huge advocate for education, I do think, unfortunately, we're going to have to see some more pain in the world, right? Some more hyperinflation, some more capital controls, some more oppression, hopefully not war, but probably more war, before people really start to wake up to the reality of how important owning your purchasing power in a way that's independent of political power truly is. Hey everybody, welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money Show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first, which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor and thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start uh, a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm gonna do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Today's podcast is brought to you by In Wolf's Clothing. Wolf is the first startup accelerator dedicated exclusively to the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Four times per year, Wolf brings teams from around the world to New York City to work with like-minded entrepreneurs, pushing the boundaries of what's possible with Bitcoin and Lightning. The program is designed to help early stage companies achieve product market fit, develop their brand, secure early stage funding, and grow businesses that help fuel the global adoption of Bitcoin. So go to wolfnyc.com to learn more about the program or apply. Again, that's WolfNYC, W-O-L-F-N-Y-C dot com. Today, you know, we're going to be talking about Bitcoin, how it's related to financial independence, and as well as how it's related to the classical liberal principles in general. So it's heavy to cover all of this in like less than an hour, but we'll try. But before... I invite our guest, uh, let me just give a brief introduction to the topic. So we know that uh, we've been at the whole world, we've been on a roller coaster uh, with families losing homes, businesses shutting down, and especially COVID was a huge factor in all of this, and then inflation, and um, it's just building debt and centralization across the world, I would say. And um, it makes you wonder, how can a system designed to protect and support us like that was the whole purpose right but we see it failing in such a dramatic fashion so but you know there is actually a twist in the tale so if we for example choose to focus on bitcoin uh we can actually turn this whole thing around and what i mean by that is that um it could shield our hard-earned money from the wings of governments and inflation so you wouldn't have to worry how much value your money would have in the future if you decide to keep it or whatever. Um, but we know all of this stuff, but we know that there are still some people who worry about Bitcoin's unpredictability. Uh, others are concerned about what it could be associated with. So we're going to talk about all of this stuff. But um, now I want to introduce our guests because he's an expert on this issue. We have Robert Breedlove join us. Um, he, he became a renowned Bitcoin advocate for his insightful views on the essence of money, and especially uh, for his show called What is Money? Um, but l I I'd like him to tell us more about what he does, and then we can talk about today's topic. So 
Hello. 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 How are you doing? I'm doing great. Great. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for joining. Yeah, thank you for having me. So, would you like to first of all tell us a little bit about how you came to this path and what changed you? Yes. Yeah, so my um, background is in accounting and finance. Uh, I got a college degree in accounting and finance focused on taxation. So, and I, my father before me was also an accountant. So I guess I've always had a, a predilection towards studying economics, mm -hmm. money, etc. Um, but one thing I really noticed is from a very young age, I've been an avid reader. And when I got, when I went to school, um, I had been reading stuff like The Economist magazine before going to college. And I was trying to get my head around the nature of markets. You know, I didn't understand the stock market. I couldn't understand what people were doing with these pieces of paper and abstractions. It was giving them so much um, motivation, let's say, to trade and, and um, how that actually fit into the real movement of goods and services in the world. I wasn't clear on that. So when I was studying, uh, sort of reading The Economist, magazine pretty aggressively um, also reading some other economic economics newsletters and I, I was always left with this kind of unknown this question mark of the nature of, of money and, and markets themselves and it wasn't until I discovered the book the creature from Jekyll Island by Gia Griffin that talks about well he actually has a chapter in their title what is money which I think I unconsciously adopted for the namesake of the show he also goes into the history of central banking. He's really focused on the inception of the U.S. Central Bank, which is the Federal Reserve. And uh, that gave me the revelation that central banking and the monopolization of money was the main problem in the world. You know, it's, it's used to fund warfare. So World War I and World War II were as bad as they were, largely because of central banking. Um, it's also used to fund a lot of mainstream media, slash propaganda, slash psyops. So there's this deep connection between, you know, the monopolization of money and central banking and all of the bullshit we see in the world, all of the destruction we see in the world. And so my, my revelation was, oh man, this is, this is the problem. This is the thing we really need to focus our energies on addressing. But at the time, this is before Bitcoin existed, uh, when I discovered this book, there wasn't really a practical solution. There was no... There was no engineered money, engineered monetary system that could be independent of the state. And that was just, it seemed like an unsolvable problem, essentially, at the time. Because gold had kind of served this purpose historically of being a money independent of the state, but because of its physicality, it became centralized over time, and central banking was really the culmination of gold's failure as money. So I didn't, I couldn't see a way out of that problem. And then, fast forward, um, to 2014, I started to hear about Bitcoin for the first time, and I, you know, just wrote it off initially. I don't know, like so many people, I thought it was just magic internet money, sounded like a scam, couldn't believe people were taking it seriously, and then uh, I didn't pay attention, it kind of went into a bear market and lost my attention, and it wasn't until 2016, 2017 that I started to pay most attention. I actually started to buy some of the some of the asset, along, some of Bitcoin, along with some other crypto assets. And as I always say when I tell this story, where my money went, my money followed. So I really started to scrutinize these assets and um, try to get valuation frameworks around them. Uh, I was doing some some professional asset management at the time, so I wanted to understand how to value these assets. And as a process of so just going through that diligence over time, I became more and more narrowly focused on Bitcoin at the exclusion of everything else. And the punchline there would be that Bitcoin, in my view, is the only truly decentralized crypto asset. That all other crypto assets are decentralized in name only, and they are in fact controlled by an individual or a group of individuals who can arbitrarily change the rules at any time. And that is pretty much like the financial system we're in today, right? This whole rules for me, not for the situation um, exists on every crypto asset network with the exception of Bitcoin. And that's why Bitcoin is fundamentally different than everything else. And um, yeah, I guess that what got me onto the podcast thing was in trying to explain how 
Bitcoin is different and what Bitcoin is, I think the first answer you get to the question of what is Bitcoin is Bitcoin is money. So then the natural extension of that line of inquiry is, well, what is money? And once you ask that question, um, it's a very seemingly simple question. You open up this window into the nature of complex systems. Uh, you open up this window into the limitations of human language. And it's become quite a philosophical rabbit, if you will, that we chase down the rabbit hole. And the show has become quite popular. You know, we, I think we've crossed like 16 million downloads since inception. Uh, we started in November 2020, so it's, uh, it's grown very quickly. I'm surprised there's so many people that are interested in such esoteric, nuanced, philosophical discourse. But uh, very grateful to be doing what I do, and um, yeah, grateful to be here with you today to talk about it. Yeah, I think the the main reason of why people are seemingly more interested in this issue is because as art, they can also see the problem within the current system and how it just doesn't make sense to kind of like fully trust and go with the flow when you can have an alternative system like the Bitcoin. But so you actually already answered uh, my first question. I was just going to ask what is money, how, how Bitcoin is like related to all of this stuff and how money creation affects the society. If you want to like talk more about yeah. that. Yeah, happy to. And so again, answering the question, what is money? I don't know that there ever is an answer, a final answer. Austria economists will tell you, which is a great answer, it's a universal medium of exchange. Mm -hmm. um, and exchange is something that's fundamental to human society. It's kind of the, the whole point, really, is that we can enjoy the division of labor, which is that when you're better at making something than I am and vice versa, we both benefit by trading. It's a win-win situation. That's really the whole point of us forming into these groups. Um, now, you can argue too, obviously humans are social animals, we like, we enjoy one another's company, et cetera, et cetera. But the pragmatic truth is that we need one another to increase our productivity and enjoy a higher standard yeah. of living, acting in concert rather than isolation or antagonism. And so money is basically the social technology or social construct that facilitates exchange at the highest intensity. So by tra instead of trying to trade with one another directly, right, and we, we encounter this, the non-coincidence of wants problem, right? You might not have what I want and vice versa. We might not want to trade at the same time. We might not want to trade at the same place. So instead of trying to trade goods and services directly, you know, chickens for cows or cows for cars or cars for ink pens, we use this intermediary, this intermediate layer and that's effectively what money is. Mm -hmm. And so the question naturally comes up, where does that come from? How did we decide yeah. that we're going to have this intermediary social construct that facilitates exchange? Obviously, there's a need for it. We can understand that. But how does it emerge? And I think mm -hmm. the great, great book to point people here on is on the origins of money by Carl Minger. And he has a pretty simple argument that Basically, anywhere people have grouped together, there has been trade, and then whatever asset becomes most tradable, or most marketable, or most liquid, or most saleable, these are other terms used to kind of describe the liquidity of an asset, in that trading network is by definition money, right? It's the thing that is most widely accepted in trade. So, you know, Money has manifested itself in many different goods over time. People have used seashells, salt, glass beads, monetary metals, government paper, et cetera, et cetera. And so what, and, and this is where people try to describe the properties of money, you're going to get a wide different set of answers. Some people will tell you, you know, a handful. Some people will tell you there's 15 or 20 properties. I prefer to go with late, Great Gary North's uh, five properties of money that he lays out in his book, Honest Money. And these are the characteristics or 
properties people are looking for in a monetary technology as as they're trading with one another and they're looking to hold the asset that optimally preserves purchasing power over time people look for goods that are divisible durable recognizable portable and scarce these are the five properties of money that and again people give you different sets of answers that's how gary north narrowed it down and that's how that's the description i like most so that's what i go with and um, those properties basically were the best tool for the job historically were monetary metals right monetary metals are relatively divisible right you can have a gold bar you can have gold coins um they're they're somewhat they're durable obviously right they persist across time monetary metal does not corrode or uh, or degrade like fruit or an organic material would uh, metals are also portable although they actually suffer in this dimension it's very expensive and risky to move large amounts of gold around for instance it's very heavy it can be seized so you need a lot of security you need a lot of uh, logistical infrastructure to move it around and it's expensive to do so so actually monetary metals suffer in terms of portability although they are somewhat portable um, they're also recognizable and that you can verify the authenticity of the metal with gold these are called to assay gold a-s-s-a-y there was a set of techniques you could use to basically verify that it was gold rather than some other uh, counterfeit metal. It's also where we get the term sound money, because you could drop a, a gold coin from a certain height, and it would make a very specific sound. And that was used as like a, a rule of thumb or a heuristic or a shortcut for testing the veracity of the authenticity of gold rather than actually going through the, the pain of, of doing the, the assaying. And then finally, money needs to be scarce right so mm -hmm. uh sc and scarce meaning uh, it's not purely a supply side phenomenon scarcity exists anywhere demand exceeds supply right so the example i like to give here is very it's fundamentally different than value uh, for instance oxygen right it's very valuable to human existence yeah. we need to breathe every few seconds or minutes if we're really good at holding our breath, yet there's no price for oxygen. We don't have to buy it. It's basically free. Hopefully things stay that way. Um, and that's because the supply of oxygen so radically outstrips the demand that there's it's not scarce, right? There's, we have more than we need. So we're always, um, although it's extremely valuable, it's not scarce. Uh, something like, like diamonds, uh, which might be kind of a bad example because the De Beers company runs a weird monopoly on diamonds and they make them more scarce than they actually are. But it's not valuable in the sense that it's essential to life, but obviously diamonds fetch a very high price. It's because demand exceeds supply, essentially. And so money, again, if money is this instrument or tool we use to facilitate the exchange of goods and services, goods and services are by definition scarce right if they have a price people are fighting over them or people are bidding to acquire them that means there's more demand than there is supply yeah. so essentially anything that has a market price is scarce by definition money is the, the tool we use to acquire scarce goods and services so if the monetary technology itself is not scarce then it will not maintain purchasing power across time it will be printed it will be debased it will be produced in excess uh, as we see with fiat currency and as we've seen with monetary metals that competed with gold over time because this is what makes gold so special all the monetary metals more or less fulfill those five properties of money but gold specifically is much more scarce it's much more difficult to expand the supply of gold therefore it holds purchasing power better over time which led to gold becoming the de facto universal money chosen by the free market and so I, I frame all that, and that's a long answer, but I think it's really useful to understand the properties of money because then you can see, oh, this makes sense. This is why metals are good. This is why gold was best. And then it also gives you the right prism through which to evaluate Bitcoin. Um, and I won't go into detail here, but let's just say for short, Bitcoin is effectively 
perfected the five properties of money. It's infinitely divisible. It's perfectly durable. It's digital information, so you can move it at the speed of light, so it's perfectly yeah. portable. You can verify and audit the entire Bitcoin network on your own node. You can authenticate every transaction, right? This is, you're not trusting anyone, you're running the numbers yourself, so it's perfectly recognizable. And finally, it's the first fixed supply asset humans have ever created. I argue the only one we'll ever be able to create uh, due to path dependence and network effects and some other things. So Bitcoin has basically perfected scarcity as well. So what is Bitcoin? Well, what is money? Money's, I don't know, it's got a lot of answers. One of the most useful yeah. answers is it's the thing that best satisfies these five properties. And mm -hmm. what is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is the thing that has virtually perfected all five properties of money that, that market actors seek in money. So for that set of reasons, most of us think Bitcoin is a very good deal. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, iCoin Technology. iCoin has just released a sleek new hardware wallet. Looks like a mini iPhone, a little touch screen and camera on it. Uh, the device has no Wi-Fi, no cellular connection, no GPS. It's a strictly physically cold hardware wallet. Uh, like I said, it's got a high-res 3-inch touch screen. It's got a camera for air gapping the wallet. Uh, it's got optional Bluetooth compatibility, and it's a really a, a brand new UI, UX experience for a hardware wallet, making it very accessible, easy to use, not intimidating. And as we always talk about on this show, the only way you can truly own your Bitcoin is by having it in self-custody. So you need a device like iCoin Wallet to truly own your Bitcoin. Go to iCoinTechnology.com today and use promo code BITCOIN23 for 30% off of this new sleek hardware wallet. So uh, I'm going to go over the questions now uh, because I see people have been chatting here. Uh, and I would like to remind once again, like, you can always ask your questions either in the comment or in that, uh, you know, question mark there. But let me, let me, see. yeah. Check a few of the questions that we have here. Um, okay. So someone is asking, um, is Satoshi our own government as a mass operation to prepare people for CBDC? Yeah, this is a silly one. I've heard a lot. And yeah. I mean, first of all, who knows? We actually, who knows? Nobody knows who Satoshi is. Um, I don't think we're ever going to know and I think that's good for Bitcoin it just cements its mystique as a decentralized asset like there's no individual to target or blame or run a smear campaign on and that's important right that means the project it, the project ma maintains its neutrality by virtue of not having an identifiable founder mm. now this theory comes up a lot oh one of the government just created the Prepare people for CBDC. Um, I actually consider CBDC to be a competitive response to Bitcoin. Banks. Central banks and nation states are threatened by Bitcoin, so they're responding by the the specter of creating CBDCs. Now, so we don't know who Satoshi is, but if Satoshi were a government agent or look at the government itself or central bank, whatever, that was trying to create Bitcoin to prepare people for CBDCs, why would they invent a monetary technology that they themselves cannot control? And that is the actually the perfect competitive response for an individual. If I'm being threatened by CBDCs, they're going to seize my bank accounts or force convert them into central bank digital currencies that are centrally controllable. I mean, Bitcoin is my only option in that scenario. It's like, I need to exit the fiat currency and go to Bitcoin. So why would they use the perfect escape option for individuals to prepare people for the ultimate instrument of tyranny? I, that just doesn't rationally compute in my mind. So the answer is we don't know. And the further answer is like, even if it were the NSA, the CIA, whoever, that created Bitcoin, they really shot themselves in the foot because you've given people this instrument of self-sovereignty of, of yeah. individual empowerment that is 
the only way out of being forced into a CBD system. If you imagine CBDCs emerging without the Bitcoin exit option, what would you do? You would go into physical gold, right? And sure, that works, kind of, but it's very practical. It comes with all these risks we talked about in terms of storage and transport. Um, not very, very useful for small day-to-day -day purchases. You know, you try to buy coffee with the gold, you're, you're transacting in gold yeah. dust, very practical. So it just doesn't make sense to me that Bitcoin would have been created by the very institutions that it purports to disrupt. That just doesn't ring a bell for me. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, like it's like willingly giving up the control. It, if, if the control was the purpose, they wouldn't do that in the first place, like putting it in a very like brief format. But uh, in one of your interviews, I remember that you said uh, money is the only commodity that makes situations worse as its production increases. So I was wondering if it's this obvious that money has been a control tool for the government and centralized powers have been using it to, you know, regulate our lives. Uh, why do people just like not stop using it and they choose the alternative, which is Bitcoin? Especially you would expect that, for example, from the younger generation. I mean, we can see a tendency, but it's not as much as like it should have been. That's how I feel about it. Um, so how can we get this... Um, like heard and are pursued by the young generation. Um, do, do, should we do activism about it? Do you think like organizations like us could play a role in like educating people and especially young generation about it? What do you think is that that we're not doing well enough? If I yeah. That? So to first um, just clarify the point that I think you're referring to is that money is unique in this way that anytime we expand the supply of goods and services in the world, we are better off, right? There's more okay. capital, there's a higher standard of living, there's more potential future consumption, right? There's mm -hmm. more, there's more food, there's more houses, cars, whatever the thing may be. Mm -hmm. you, we want to expand the supply of everything, every good and service, like as high as we can, because that means more people's wants are being satisfied, more problems are being solved, more wealth exists in the world, basically. So that that's true for all commodities, all goods and services, except money. Right? You don't actually want to expand the supply of money yeah. because when you expand the supply of money, you're debasing the purchasing power because money is just it's kind of a reflection of the, the economy, right? It's this instrument that allows you to acquire goods and services. Mm -hmm. And that's what the purchasing power contained in money is, right? It's potential goods and services, if you will. And so when you you arbitrarily expand the supply, you're just debasing people that are holding savings in the cash or in the money itself. So, in as a, an opposite tact, right, you actually, the ideal money would be one in which we cannot change the supply at all. The thing with the least flexible supply. That's what, that's what is op optimized for the interests of individual savers and market participants, is a money with the least flexible supply, which is what gold was, right? We, for 5,000 years, we couldn't really change its supply more than 2% on average each year. You know, there's slight fluctuations to this. When we, we'd make a big gold discovery, like the South American Bonanza, you'd get, it would flux upward for a few decades, but the, the long run average has been about 2%. That's what made gold money, right? That's why it was sound money, it held purchasing power, uh, it was an asset independent of the state. It wasn't legally decreed. It was free market selected, all of these things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, to take that a step further, an ideal money would be one with a perfectly inflexible supply. And that's what Bitcoin is, right? 21 million Bitcoin is a perfectly inelastic supply. So to answer your question as to why don't more people realize this, mm -hmm. This is a tough one, right? I think memories are short. Um, the only reason the dollar is so widely accepted in the world today is because it was once redeemable for gold. Well, again, back to the portability shortcomings of gold, this is why we centralized its custody and issued a gold-backed currency in the first place. We needed a paper instrument, or we needed an augmentation to a gold standard 
that made it more transactable, that let, let me move the money across space more easily. Mm -hmm. And so that's what dollars are, it's the purpose of dollars. And obvi obviously any electronic representation of dollars is obviously yeah. very easy to move across space, right? You can send Venmo payments, wire transfers, etc. Mm -hmm. This was a technical workaround for the limited portability of gold itself. People only accepted dollars originally then because they were redeemable for gold. And so that persists for a few decades. And then I don't know what this bias is called, but where humans start to mistake the symbol for the referent or the, the symbol for that which is being symbolized. Mm -hmm. So you start holding this piece of paper in your pocket and transacting in it and saving in it. And you maybe start to get acquire trust in that paper, like it actually has value. Even though the paper was just a proxy for gold, right? It was just an IOU to take it to the, the bank or the warehouse and say, hey, give me my real money, the gold. It's just a debt certificate. But if you do that for enough decades or generations, or I'm not sure of the exact amount of time, people just start to get comfortable with the paper. And so, so long as there's no major economic a catastrophe or big runs on the bank, and even if there are runs on the bank, you can have something like Executive Order 6102, which is what we had in 1933, I believe, that outlawed private gold ownership. So even people that wanted to redeem these paper certificates for gold were uh, prohibited by law from doing so, and prohibited from owning gold independently and privately. So I think people naturally start to answer your question, like, why don't people understand this? Mm -hmm. I think it's that effect, that you start to just kind of trust the dollar, right, the greenback, and you don't understand the broader history of money. You maybe have, you're a little too myopic, right? You're, even in our lifetime, none of us have experienced the gold standard, not anything even close to it, right? We've been, been off, 1971 is now 52 years ago since Nixon closed the gold window. So what, to try and explain something to people that eclipses, like the historical sequence of events eclipses their own life, right? None of us were alive to see that. That's yeah. difficult. It's di there's not many people that are gonna do that cognitive work, I think, to understand the nature of the dollars they have in their pocket, right? They're just kind of doing what they see other people do, doing what they've done their whole lives. Not everyone has the patience or the, the aptitude or the willingness to be a monetary historian. So that, maybe that, uh, that trustingness, you know, where people just kind of want to trust that the thing that has been working will continue to work. Yeah, is, it's is so, the way is, it has been, right. that kind of bias. Yeah, yeah status quo bias, you might say. Mm -hmm. And it's just an exploit it's an opportunity to ex exploit people especially when you fuel it with propaganda right when governments are trying, trying to go off the gold standard they you know we had john maynard Keynes, famously called famously called gold a barbarous relic it was like it's this is the thing that's holding back the economy we need more control more planning more more monopolies more central banks controlling the money to like move the economy forward so when you combine people's sort of short memories or uh, proclivity to trust the symbol over that which is symbolized, when you combine that with propaganda and you know, false ideologies really being pushed about money, mm -hmm. I can see how you could deceive a lot of people into believing that this global coordinated currency counterfeiting operation, or, or it's not an operation, these are cartels of central banks, right? They, you can sell that to people. This, the currency counterfeiting cartels are somehow necessary and healthy for the global economy, and people will buy into that. So, and the third part of your question, you know, what can we do? Well, I think education is important. I think yeah. groups like yourself, right, Students for Liberty, educating young minds about the actual principles of economics, how how central banking actually works, what money actually is, how it actually emerged. I mean, these things are great. These things are critical. Um, people that are willing to do the work can learn 
from the mistakes of others, right? We don't need to go out and repeat these mistakes ourselves again. We don't need to hyperinflate the currency again. We don't need to go to World War Three. You know, like you don't have to learn these painful, awful lessons when mm-hmm. you just study the actual principles of economics and see them overlaid across history, and you can understand uh, what's caused these problems. But mm-hmm. so that's great. Yes, education. I'm a, obviously a huge advocate of it. Doing it on the show all the time. However, there's a kind of a dark side to this too. Is I don't think the majority of people want to be educated, actually, or at least want to do the work to figure these things out. People, oh, yeah. people really tend to move, like especially make major moves where you're gonna, you know, the money you've been using your whole life, I'm gonna switch to using a new money. The only thing that's gonna catalyze a significant change for most people is pain, right? The current Currency hyperinflates, or your your Canadian truck protester, and your bank account is frozen, or your contributor to the protest, and your bank account is frozen, or your assets are seized, or you're trying to escape a war zone, and they're seizing your money at the border, or there's capital controls, and you can't get more than 50k out of the country per year, or any of these. Any of these acts of coercion or oppression by the state is what really teaches most people yeah. the importance of money that is independent from the state. It's like when you really need to have something that you can own in a way that no one can can do anything about. You have a form of private property that's truly private and truly property in the sense that no one can take it from you. That's when most people learn. So mm-hmm. although I'm a huge advocate for education, I do think, unfortunately, we're going to have to see some more pain in the world, right? Some more hyperinflations, some more capital controls, some more oppression, hopefully not war, but probably more war, before people really start to wake up to the reality of how important owning your purchasing power in a way that's independent of political power truly is. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Wasabi Wallet. With Wasabi Wallet, you can receive, send, and store Bitcoin privately. In Wasabi Wallet, your transaction history and wallet balance are completely hidden. Wasabi Wallet is easy to use. All of its privacy features are built in by default, and it works with any amount of Bitcoin. Wasabi users can make CoinJoin transactions together with BTC Pay server users or Trezor Suite users. For BTC Pay server users, they can make payments directly inside of a coin join. And for Trezor Suite users, you can make coin joins directly on a hardware wallet. These features result in the fee savings and security improvements for both sets of users. So go to wasabiwallet.io today to download the state of the art Bitcoin privacy wallet. I think that's a very great lesson to take from this live, at least for the people who joined. Um, I have a couple of more questions, but we're short on time. So I would like to get one audience question now and then, uh, yeah, we can continue as much as we can. So someone here asks, I own some Bitcoin and the obvious benefit is that it cannot be inflated, but does it have a critical flow in that supply, uh, in that supply does not flex with demand and only price can fluctuate. Does it make sense? Yeah, I would say this is a bad take probably got from Keynesian economic teacher or textbook. There's this fallacious argument that, oh, a money supply needs to expand at the same rate or close to the same rate as the economy expands. So again, we said earlier, we want to maximize the supply of all goods and services, right? That's clear, right? More goods and services, means higher standard of living, obviously a good thing. Now the argument that's being made there is like, well, the rate at which you expand goods and services, which is to say the rate that you expand the economy or productivity, however you want to put this, you need to expand the money supply at the same rate. And so it's it's almost like a conflation of terms or you're not understanding what money is. Again, if it's an instrument used to buy goods and services, it's not the goods and services themselves. And you can, you can come to understand this a little bit when you think, okay, 
if that's the case, and we need to expand the money supply by whatever percentage goods and services are being expanded, the question is then, who should be reaping the benefit of that newly printed money? Who should the benefits of that money go to? So we expand the goods and services 5%, and we're like, okay, we need to expand the money supply by exactly 5%. Who does it go to? Who do you dole that out to? And if, you, if your answer is everyone, which seems fair, right? It's like, oh, we'll just give it to everyone. This this kind of socialistic thing. Then you've accomplished absolutely nothing because you would have diluted everyone's savings to the exact same extent that goods and services increased, right? So it, if you increase, it's all about, the thing about inflation and currency counterfeiting in general is that it's redistributive. When, this is the Cantillon effect. Those who get the newly printed money first are stealing from those who get the newly printed money last. Now it's not a perfect binary. It's like the earlier you get it, the more you benefit, the later you get it, the more you suffer. So just ask yourself that question. Okay, if you believe this Keynesian theory, money supply needs to expand at the same rate of, as goods and services, ask yourself who gets the newly printed money and why would they? And if you follow that all the way to its just conclusion, like, oh, well, everyone should get it, then you're basically saying we shouldn't print money. And you're saying that, no, we don't need to expand the money supply. And you're saying that, oh, Bitcoin is the best money. So you just have to think through the whole argument. I think that's a great answer. And I hope that, yeah, answers the question. Uh, we had one more here. Alex asked, asked that, uh, what is money? And that that would be the best question. But I want to say that we already answered and we discussed a lot about it in the beginning. But I'm going to upload this live after it ends on our page if you want to check it out. And everyone, make sure that you check out the What is uh, Money podcast after this live as well. Uh, I want to just do a quick announcement. So for those people who are joining this live, we have Breathe Love promo code for a 10% discount for LibertyCon International that is happening next February in Washington, D.C. So it, and uh, Robert is going to be there as well. So if you want to, you know, discuss all of this in more detail where we have more time, with a lot of like-minded people, this is the best opportunity. And with that, I want to ask the last question, and hopefully, um, what, I mean, this is a very huge topic, and uh, but this is what it is, so maybe we can continue later. But um, for those who believe in the potential of Bitcoin, and we see some people here, we see some at our organization, but also for those people who are, you know, who want to try out, but they're initially skeptical because of whatever reasons that we just talked about. Uh, how do you think, how do you think uh, accepting classical liberal philosophy and ideas can actually empower this individual to understand Bitcoin more deeply and use it for finally achieving that financial independence? Yeah, that is a colossal question, I think, to say the least. Um, I'll try to just... Yeah. provide a few insights if I can. So, you know, one of the things I think is very interesting about Bitcoin is that it is the hardest asset to seize or steal or forcefully appropriate ever, right? Um, now, if you custody it properly, which again, my Suggestion here is always a multi-key or multi-signature solution, which basically means to hold Bitcoin is to hold its private key. And by way of simple analogy, you can think about this as your Bitcoin password. It's not technically a password, but just think of it like that, right? It's an alphanumeric string. If you lose that private key or someone else discovers the private key, right? You like It's just like your password. You have to keep it a secret. If someone else discovers it, or you reveal it to someone, well, then they have your password. They can access the email account or whatever it may be. With Bitcoin, it's a much more serious breach. If, if you reveal your private key to someone, they can take all the money that is associated with that private key. So a multi-key is where you take one private key and you chop it into pieces. So it could be three pieces, five pieces, etc. And then you can selectively give that to different people you trust, right? Maybe you give one to your husband, one to your kid, one to your accountant, one to your lawyer, and you need a three of five, you keep one yourself, you need three of five to unlock the Bitcoin and spend it. Now, if you put it in a multi-key, that's, that's 
damn near impossible to coerce that from somebody. Because even if someone puts a gun to your head, you're like, I have one of five keys. I can't do anything. If they, you know, don't do it to someone else. And like, assuming you've used the right five people and you're geographically distributed, you're not hanging out in the same place at the same time, and someone doesn't know you're in the a multi key, it makes Bitcoin damn near impossible to steal at all. So if we're looking at the natural law, you know, natural law being sort of this, and this is like the exclusive philosophical purpose of government, preserve life, liberty, and property. So, and you can collapse all of that, right? If natural law is the preservation or optimization for life, liberty, and property, mm -hmm. to kill someone is to steal their life, right? You're, you've stolen their future freedom. Yeah. To incarcerate or restrict someone's freedom of movement is to steal their present freedom, right? Their mm -hmm. present ability to move around. And to steal someone's assets or purchasing power is to take the fruits of their past freedom. So you can compress life, liberty, and property into this very simple slogan that crystallizes all of natural law, as far as I can tell, and it's do not steal. Do, do not steal. Like that's the ethos of natural law. Do not steal, which steal includes do not kill, do not restrict, do not steal right in the traditional sense so the interesting thing about bitcoin is that it makes stealing so much more risky expensive or even impossible with money in particular now obviously this doesn't change the nature of physical possession right people can still steal your car or your house yeah. or whatever right but for this very important form of private property we call money bitcoin can make it theft proof. And so therefore it's very concordant with the core ethos of natural law, which is do not steal. And so I think that is very fascinating to me. Um, and the consequences of that are very difficult to understand because the state is the social apparatus of coercion, compulsion, and violence. It generates all of its revenues through non-consensual exchange, which is to say stealing, right? Taxation is theft. So the question becomes like, all right, when people are tired of having their currencies hyperinflated or living under persistent inflation for long periods of time, or they're otherwise subjected to government oppression or taxation in amounts that they deem intolerable, people now have access to this purchasing power this tool for the preservation of purchasing power that cannot be inflated, cannot be stolen if, if custody properly. Well, that means the harder the state tries to drive up revenue through taxation and inflation, the more pressure it's creating for people to adopt or to at least move some of their purchasing power into Bitcoin so that they can be immune from this forced wealth redistribution from this stuff. And so it's like the harder the state pushes, tries to drive up its own revenue, the more demand it's creating for theft-proof money. And so I, I think, again, it's hard to imagine how much a change in incentive structure like this means for our institutional realities. And this is where a lot of Bitcoiners describe Bitcoin as the separation of money and state. And at a minimum, it would shrink centralized government, it would shrink the state. And at a maximum, it could be the end of the state. We may move away from statism as a paradigm in total over the next few centuries. Like it's hard, it's difficult to imagine where this can lead to. And I guess most of it boils down to how much do you believe that material incentives influence human action? And I, I mean, when I look out on the world, I, yeah, I see people doing whatever is profitable, right? People, yeah. people get out of bed, they're chasing the dollar or whatever they're doing to try and put food on the table, roof over the head, pay bills, etc. And people will feel every nook and cranny for things that are profitable, right? People do disgusting things to make money. I don't just mean disgusting like, you know, you're cleaning out sewers or something, but people will do terrible things, right? They'll, they'll steal people's organs. They'll kill people for money, like horrible things. If we can make those, Horrible things, at least, at least 
It's the systematic stealing, killing, and destroying that states engage in. We can make that less profitable. Can we therefore make it less prevalent in the sphere of human affairs? And so, if so, then Bitcoin is a really, really, really big deal. Like, it changes the way we treat one another. It's almost incentivizing people to treat one another as ends in ourselves rather than as means to an end. Mm -hmm. And the, the implications of that, again, are difficult to imagine, but they make Bitcoin very exciting and they make the Bitcoin rabbit hole a really fun place to explore. That's a very a great conclusion. And I see a lot of people are discussing here in the comments. Um, it, it is indeed a very interesting topic to discuss and to think the extent to which it can change things fundamentally and how it can actually enhance our freedom is actually, I think, what relates it so much to, you know, classical liberalism, libertarianism, and like, um, and that, that should be something on the top of the minds for everyone, I think, who is interested in this field, you know. Um, so I want to thank you. Uh, unfortunately, we have to end this here because of the time limit, but we appreciate your time. And once again, um, I want to thank the audience for their discussion and for participation. If you want to see the continuation of this topic and of this discussion, feel free to like visit us in Washington DC in Liberty Con and go check out um, SFL's you know website and also uh, the What Is Money show. Uh, I'm looking forward to the future discussion and have a nice one. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye.